Welcome, everybody, to uh, our program this year. We thank you very much for finding the time out of your busy schedule to attend our program today. Ibadan Literary Society organized this event to celebrate the Nigerian uh, playwright, Femi Oshof uh, Fison, who is here among us today. It's going to be his 70th birthday anniversary tomorrow. And uh, we organized this uh, symposium to honor him, honor his achievement as one of the leading uh, playwrights in the world, foremost playwright in Nigeria. First, a word about about the Literary Society and why we organize uh, this uh, event. The formation of Ibadan Literary Society was formalized um, in 2010 to create a cultural map of Ibadan. Create a cultural map of Ibadan. Ibadan city is uh, in the Southwest of Nigeria. The idea was partly inspired by the documentary film Ibadan, the credo of literati produced and directed by Nigerian filmmaker Femi Odubemi. Ibadan was settled as a war camp in 1829 and within 10 years had become the leading center of education and Christian growth in Nigeria or in Yoruba land. Christian missionary Reverend David Hendora and his wife Anna of the Church Mission Society started the first Western style schools in what would later become modern day Nigeria on 29 May, 1853. With the first purpose being the children of High Chief Olun Loyo, the four year old Akinyele and the six year old Yejide. Prior to the Hinduras, there were several Islamic madrasas due to Ibadan's closeness and association with the Fulanis and other Arabic scholars in particular from Mali Hence, the Yoruba interpretation of Islam as Esi in Mali, that is the religion from Mali or the religion of the Malians. And the first university in Nigeria was established in Ibadan in 1948. Ibadan became the literary and cultural hub of Nigeria prior to colonial independence in 1960, with several writers, artists, and scholars living and researching in the city. A position reinforced with the establishment of the university, the formation of Mbari arts movement, and the setting up of many publishing houses, including Spectrum Books, most Euro publishers, Craft Books, Book Craft, and the Nigerian offices of Cambridge University's Press, Oxford University Press, Heinemann Educational Publishers, Evans Brothers, and so on. Writers with association to Ibadan include the Nobel laureate, Walesh Inka, Austrian Uli Bayer, Jurula Dipo, Kola Gumola, South African SKM Patlele, John Pepe Clark, Peke Deremo, Akibu Minshola, Bodesho and of course, Femi Oshofison. A key objective of Ibadan Literary Society is the creation of a literary map of Ibadan, providing biographical and bibliographical data on writers and artists, including those already listed. And that is one of the reasons why we're actually doing this symposium today. And we plan to establish a center in Ibadan, consisting of galleries, a museum, conference facilities, archival system, and a major research center on the growth and development of culture and literature in Nigeria. 
the poets laureate and university teacher, uh, Professor Neyi Oshundari, uh, agreed to be the first and the founding chairman of Ibadan Literary Society in 2015. So this year's symposium, as I earlier remarked, is organized to mark the 77th seventh birthday of playwright Femi Oshofison. Unique artist, intertextual thinker, Pan-African writer, a multiple award winner, Femi Oshofison, also known as Okimba Lanko, wears many caps as activist, playwright, scholar, poet, novelist, journalist, actor, director, songwriter, and sketch artist. He has published five novella, six volumes of poetry, and dozens of plays, including uh, The Chattery and the Song, Issue and the Vagabond Minstrels, Moron Todun, and Unkrumani Africani, which we're going to showcase tomorrow in tomorrow's edition. He's also uh, done a lot of re-readings of uh, Greek, European and Chinese classics such as Tegoni and African Antigone from Antigone, Antigone, Women of Wu from Trojan Women, Medaye from Medea, Weso Hamlet from Shakespeare's Hamlet, and All for Catherine from Kao Yu's 1933 classic Thunderstorms. It's also written the other three books of essays and the much celebrated book or biography of J.P. Clark Pekadoremo. For his work, Oshofison has received several fellowships from various global bodies, including the British Council, the International Writers' Programs at Iowa in USA, the Henry Close Foundation in Apur, France. Oshofison has also been a guest professor at several institutions all over the world, including at universities in Accra, Togo, Yonde, Leeds, Edinburgh, Beirut, Athens, Colombo, Toronto, Iowa, Evanston, and I can see here today we have a Professor Sandra Richards, also from Evanston, um, Bloomington, New York City, Beijing, and so on. Is the recipient of numerous awards, among which are the French National Order of Merit, the University of Ibadan Faculty of Arts Distinguished Alumnus Award, the Nigerian <coughs> National Order of Merit Award, which is the highest award for Nigerian academics, and the prestigious Colonel Nichols Prize. He's also a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Letters, as well as, as the first African winner of the Thalia Prize. His latest play, Kenos, or Not All Kenos Sail Back Home, Maya Angelou, Maris Conde, and Efwa Sutherland in Nkrumah's Ghana, presented at the Kennedy Center in February 2020, was published on Monday this week. Uh, in conjunction with two other plays, A Nightingale for Dr. Du Bois, which we're also, also going to show tomorrow, and the reissued Unkrumani Africani to celebrate Pan-Africanism. Today's symposium, Femi Oshofison, The Coloniality and the Repositioning of Western Modernity, is organized and de de dedicated to the work of Femi Oshofison. It's organized, as I said earlier, to mark the 77th birthday anniversary of Oshofison. I'm going to stop sharing now to uh, introduce our speakers today. These uh, speakers can uh, be on video so I can spotlight them. Right. For our lectures today, we have two speakers. Professor, first, Professor Adeleke Adieko of Ohio, Univers Ohio State University, USA, will be speaking on the topic, Return of the Less, Any Law Lobo, Rendering Afri Afriphonic English in Yoruba. Why is Professor Mabel Everoma of the University of Abuja will speak to Queering Western Modernity, Decoloniality, Text and Woman-Centered woman Context in Femi Oshofson's plays. Adeleke Adieko, spouse of Taiwo, father of Omotayo, Adebolaji, and Adedimeji, is humanities distinguished professor, English department of the Ohio State University, Columbus, Ohio. His arts of Bin Yoruba, divination, allegory, tragedy, pro proverb, and panegyric won the 
Best Book of the Year Scholarship Award of the African Literature Association. He co-edited with Ake Adeshokon, celebrating D.O. Fagunwa, Aspects of African and World Literary History in 2017. His edition of the Reverend Philip Kweke's Missionary Letters, Letters to London, 1765 to 1811, was published by the University of South African Press in 2017. Adeko is the author of Proverbs, Sexuality, and Nativism in African Literature and The Slaves' Rebellion, Literature, History, Orature. In spring 2020, he guest edited an issue of Cambridge Journal of Postcolonial Literary Inquiry on postcolonial Black Panther. His research ambition at the present time is to complete the book on speech acts in poetry. That is after presenting our lecture, by the way. Um, I'm still looking for Professor uh, Mibel Everoma. Professor Mibel, if you can turn on your video so I can spotlight you. Uh, while doing that, Mibel uh, Everoma Nito Brise is the Director Center for Gender Security Studies and Youth Advancement, University of Abuja, Nigeria. She obtained a doctorate degree in 1996 from University of Ibadan, where she trained under Femi Oshofison. Everoma is also an alumna of the Galilee College Israel. In 2016, she obtained an LLB from Ibnedo University of Kada and was called to the Nigerian bar as an attorney in 2018. She's a fellow, she's a fellow of the Society of Nigerian Theater Artists, a fellow of the Association of Nigerian Authors, and the fellow of Center for African American Research Studies. Our areas of specialization is dramatic theory and criticism with a bias for gender, women, and cultural studies. Apart from her core theater publications, Professor <coughs> Veroma has publications in feminist aesthetics, film, and woman-centered approaches to drama and society, including female empowerment and dramatic creativity, Nigerian feminist theater, essays on female access in contemporary Nigerian drama, Snapshots of the Female Ethos, Essays on Women in Drama and Culture in Africa, among our other seminar works. Um, for those who are just joining, I'm going to uh, now call on, but before I call on the speakers, a little bit of housekeeping. Please use the chat function if you have any question or comment. We'll take the questions after the two guest speakers have spoken. And for uh, record and archival purposes, we are going to record this session. So I'm going to start the recording now. Yeah. So I'm now going to call on Professor Adeleke Adeko for his lecture. The main concern of Professor Adeko's lecture today are the conceptual implications of translated literary and cultural meta language. The talk, drawing primarily from his reflections on translating Femi Oshofison's Cholera College into Yoruba, and secondarily, from the history of Yoruba literary traditions, calls attention to how differences in meta language could resist access to correlations in translations of narratives. Professor Adeko, please. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Shola Oshofisson, Oshof and also uh, my friend, uh, German and uh, for making this, uh, for inviting me to do this. I also want to thank uh, the celebrant himself, uh, Professor Femi uh, Oshofisson, whom many of you do not know, and I know, I happen to know as Oman Baba Headmaster. So you guys may not know that, but I'm sharing that with you today. Uh, I should declare from the onset that neither decoloniality nor Western modernity is central to this talk. It is my hope that the organizers will pardon me for not doing that. Nothing in my reading of Femi Oshokison leads me to believe that he wishes to reposition Western modernity, nothing. Uh, Maybe I'm wrong, I'll, be, I'll like to be corrected. 
what will we say decoloniality means? A critique of Eurocentrism, centralizing the Americas, I'm talking of decoloniality now and not decolonization, uh, centralizing the Americas and the South Atlantic in general in definitive discursive terms of global history writing, devising grand narratological terms on the basis of uh, the works of and ideas of Michel Foucault. That's my summary, my take on decoloniality in general. Because these terms come up in the talk, you may call it decolonial, but I'm not speaking of Ashofison as repositioning Western modernity. Uh, again, the thoroughgoing comparatist that Ashofison is, in the way I read him, I read Ashofison as a thoroughgoing comparatist, uh, as a scholar and a writer, will not allow him to wish to reposition Western modernity. I, as well, following the lead of Hoshofiso, I'm not going to do that. At any rate, why will anyone seek to reposition Western modernity? That's a question we may want to ask at the end. Uh, working towards reinterpreting modernity, reinterpreting modernity makes far more sense in my, to, to Oshofizor, to me. That is what I believe Oshofizor's writing calls on us to do as critics. We can take these issues that I said up in, in questions and answers, but let me offer a little more elaboration. After saying what my talk is not about, which is not to say that those things are not important, it is right that I say something regarding what it is about. The main concern for me today are the implications of translated literary and cultural meta language, and not just the text themselves. The talk, drawing param primarily from my reflections on translating Oshofisa, and secondarily from the history of Yoruba literary translations, calls attention to how differences in meta language may resist access to correlation in translations of narratives. Uh, these words, uh, I'll start with these words from Olani Kwekwesan. They were written in April, 1964. Esan is a classicist and also a comparatist. He used to teach at Ibadan. He had his uh, PhD from the University of Oklahoma, Norman, in the 1960s, long time ago. The, these words were written in April, 1964, as a conclusion to his notes, to his translator's notes on Eshiati Roja which was published in 1966. Yoruba, people who went to school in Southwestern Nigeria and of a certain age may remember this book on our school curriculum. This was the Yoruba language version of Virgil's Aeneid, published in 30 BC. And I quote uh, some terms there. Nibati moka eshiati roja, ti Virgil called the Latin. Nini were a chan queni in eight, Momo Pe, Nibi Kibi Lori or Dia Ye, Bacon, Lori Guri. Those are the words I highlighted. I said, Own Timo, only more share to my tongue, share to my tongue. You say, Dewa, Mosiro Pe, Oak Badure. You wait, you can share to my last song, Mosha, I want you, but I dare, dear. See your Jackie, turn on your mom to do a tickle down for any Latin call Latin. Essentially, what uh, Shepherdson, uh, what no, not a Shepherdson. As I says here, is that he has translated Virgil uh, because what he found it, he, he came to the conclusion that in every, everywhere in the world, the eagle is always bald headed. That's back on all, Uri whether in England, wherever they have the, the eagle, the, the head is going to be bald. And you know, he's using a proverb there. And, it, and I also highlight Iweyi and Itana, that is this book and this story as a way of separating two acts that he believed he was doing in 1964, that the book, his own book, Eshanti Roja, and Itana, the story, or the narrative that he's translating. The study of Latin, I must note as an aside, comes up as a possible cure for the for cholera epidemic in cholera college. So I just want to draw, draw that similarity as, as strange as it is. Uh, in, in, in cholera college, remember when there was a crisis, the university professors, how do we solve this problem? Oh, yeah, teach them Latin. And Latin will solve every problem. 
And here was a, a son translating Latin in the 1960s. He saw it, there's a lot of advantage to that. The significant point I want to note about the statement are about a son statement. A son considered the study of Latin as being potentially advantageous to descendants of Odudua, the way it uses language. Two, the stories of the story of subterfuge in wars, be it in the extended or your siege against Ikoro Ikichi, which is his hometown that he had from his grandparents, or in ancient Greece and Troy, they are universally appealing. And three, pleasure specific to, it, to the narrative can, can overcome differences in the languages of telling and retelling. He also wrote in his introduction to Orikilawa, and this is that, Orikilawa, another book, or his translation of Plotus's Makoto. Olukonimini University Badon, he describes himself that he's a teacher at University Badon. Then I highlighted something here. Ojo Awara, Tijawa, Yilujino, Siwa, Latin, Rome, Rome, Greece, and those places. Their days are different from ours, far, far different from ours. But their conduct, their conduct, Iwawo, is not quite, is not as strange to us, to ours. Their, con their culture, in many ways, resemble ours, especially those, the ways that were in place before the coming of, before the world became, existence became European. And I'm doing that literally. That before existence became a European. He did another one, Kasu Otokaku, and this is that one, published in 1964. Simil he used similar words, and I've quoted him here. This book is not, I did not invent them. He actually translated Plato's script. Uh, Crito in uh, ancient Greece. They are called the Helleni. Now she is more. Bugbo renure. Let's see, George Tito. Every word said in it is truthful. That is evaluation of, and that's why it translated Plato. Then Tela Dalashe, and this is the last one. I'm, the last introduction that I'm using uh, from uh, uh, Esan. Uh, I had look at I draw it only to the right part, the part I highlighted. A Romini Kikoi way in Ipe, Kuyaki, I bought Gessi, Abi, I more Greek, She, Dino Fua, that's a bad way to read on Mamabai. It is my thought that not knowing Greek should be an obstacle to our enjoying, relishing this sweet narrative. That's a song. Esau's book predates by one year, The Gods Are Not to Blame. Olaroti means more popular English adaptation of Oedipus Rex, because he also translated uh, uh, that, uh, that's the Many Yoruba speaking writers in English language seem to be fascinated by ancient Greek drama. Dr. Um, uh, Adiemi already told us, or uh, 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 work on, on the ancient Greeks. Uh, Shofison uh, reads on Shakespeare, he wrote, We're so Hamlet, uh, which I think is an allusion, a salute to his Ijebu roots. Uh, I do not know how Hamlet came to be greeted in Ijebu. I cannot tell, but you know, Ungogo Nijebu, as well as a popular musician, once said, Walesho Enka wrote the backer of Euripides and Oedipus at Colonus. And many, many Yoruba writers, they seem to be fascinated uh, by the Greeks. So, return to the, to the topic, let us juxtapose a song that I just quoted from his works, to the position Akin Umi Shola took in 1992 in, an, in a very wild, in widely read essay in research in African literatures on an issue of the question of language in African literature. Here, the playwright, that's Akin Shola, the late Professor Akin Umi Shola, and, the poet, and also a poet, decries what he deems to be, what he considers to be an ecological imbalance. I do not want to say ecological deforestation. I think that's what they meant, what you thought. Uh, what it considers to be an ecological imbalance by writers like Oshofison, who wrote primarily in languages other than historically prior and perhaps natural Yoruba of their immediate environment. Ishola asked, would the picture not have been richer if writers such as Walesha Inka 
Ola Rochi mi, boss, Femi or Shofison, TM Aluko, Holly a motor show, Modesho and De, Modio Soin, and Amos Tituola had written in Yoruba. Historical conditions largely determine a writer's choice of language. But don't writers have a moral obligation to give something back to the literary ecosystem from which they initially drew their inspiration? Well, I'm hanging Ishala's question for now. I'll come back to him at the end of this presentation. So Esson, translating, but now I want to bring Esson and uh, 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 Ishala together. So Esson, translating Greek and Latin texts brings some life enriching experience to mid century Yoruba conduct in spite of the long separation in time. One anecdote I always retell to my students in Columbus, Ohio, every time I teach Booker T. Washington stuff from slavery, usually taking my copy to class for show and tell, is how Adeboye Babalola's Atokwerudide, Atokwerudide, 1966, left me dejected when I first read it in primary three or third grade in American speech. The scene that caused me that somber reaction was where the young Booker T. Booker T. Washington was asked to clean up a room, not knowing that the school principal's wife was testing his suitability for the trade school he wished to attend. Of course, young Booker T. passed the test. He did not know it was a test when he was asked to clean a room. I, then in primary three in Ijebu Mushi, Nigeria, imagined him, imagining myself to be about of Washington's age. Washington's a little older than me when I was in third grade, but that's what I imagined. When he aced that stealth exam, I was sure that I would have failed because I hated sweeping and other domestic chores. As some will probably call my anecdote, what I just said, a clear illustration of how translation reveals literature's untetherability to specific languages of articulation. The literature, once, once it becomes a narrative, you can't tether it like, like a cow to, 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 to a language. Through translation, to further follow a song, the story of a young, recently emancipated Booker T. Washington in late 19th century small town, West Virginia, in what you now call to the United, United States, touched me, a young reader, third grader, in small, living in a small Ijebu town in Swat, southwestern Nigeria. Well, this talk is not about Washington, and I consider it prudent to leave him out of the discussion for now. I'll not talk about him. So, Ishala, compared to a song, works rendered in English, even in drama and theater, where dialogue is just one element within a, a, a melange of media by writers of Yoruba descent, many of whom are his contemporaries are friends, they took away something significant. They took away something significant, a small part of which could be returned through translation. Hence the, the return of my title, Any Law Lobo. Those that depart come back again. Uh, the, those who left are returning. I was not checking about the political left, essentially. Uh, Ishala's comments address the cultural ecology of literary production in late 20th century post-colonial societies. Allow me here to shout out, to uh, give a shout out uh, to, to Olufemi Taiwo's recent book, which he titled Against Decolonization, Taking African Agencies Seriously. Uh, it's a trench, it's declared a trench war in that book, uh, but that's for another day. But the idea of what to speak of decolonization one in that book speaks, uh, address, uh, is re relevant to what I'm saying about the, uh, the juxtaposing of Esson and, and Ishola. Esson, working in a more open era, when first generation of post independent scholars were coming to their own along with their newly freed. In Free countries spoke about the logic of literary and cultural arts. In Esson, translation can correlate cultural differences. Translation can correlate cultural differences. For Ishola, Ishola does not quite agree with that view, implied in his words that is that some critical beyond to language, there is a beyond to language dimension that is closed off by writers who choose to write in another, in another language about another society. Only translations, a writing back of sorts, has the potential to recover a, a little part of the lost for the reader. 
the loss of the beyond the language. After having said all the above, we may still ask, what has the Eshon Ishola diet got to do with Femi Oshofison and my translation of Cholera College? Well, Ishola lists Oshofison among those who depleted or are still depleting the ecology of Yoruba literary production. So Oshofison is guilty. So Oshofison's collaboration, uh, Ishola also commends uh, Oshofison's collaboration with Dr. Ogundeji for Yepa Shola Arimbo, his translation of Who is Afraid of Shola Arimbo? Which is another uh, an adaptation of Gogo, uh, uh, the the inspector. Uh, my answering that question also requires a little backstory, for which I shall apologize to the very few, and I and I'm repeating this to highlight the fact that readership in Yoruba literature is very very slim as we speak. Readership is very in Yoruba literature is very very slim. For my translation of Cholera College, we have to do a bilingual edition with Oshofiso agreeing that we put English on one side, Yoruba on one side, with the hope that people will, for, if they do not read Yoruba for the sake of English, they will read English for the sake of Yoruba. That's why we put the two together, because it's not likely, and I agree with the, with the publisher, that the Yoruba version is not likely to do very well if you we are to, to be a standalone. Well, that's for another for a discussion. My relationship with Cholera College is very, very long, more than three decades old. And I, I will quickly skip this summary uh, uh, of that. Uh, but I, I got to the book in 2020, uh, returned in 2020 during COVID-19 lockdown, when summer travels were severely restricted. That was when the then chair of English department, my home department at Ohio State, called for us to suggest texts uh, to include in a lock, lockdown list of books that she called for a lockdown list of books, mainly for our, alum, for our alumni and the general public. Cholera College jumped to the top of the list for me. One, for, one reason for that choice is apparent. The story is about a history of a changing, of a history changing epidemic that we all experienced then, or maybe we still experience. But my other reason, and that is the wish to make friends of the English Department of Ohio State experience Oshafison's Yoruba imagination is not apparent. So there were two reasons. One was clear, history changing the epidemic. Oshafison's books about epidemic and there was history changing epidemic in that book. The, the other book was, to, the other reason for me was to make a, 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 a client as it were in Ohio, uh, be, fam, uh, be aware of Oshafison's Yoruba imagination in English language. If I can invoke a song and Ishola and unify the two motives I just motives I just summarized, Cholera Collect taught me that all knowledge in literature is inherently localized. All knowledge in literature is inherently localized. And also a corollary. All such knowledge is never local or provincial. So two, two parts to that summation. All knowledge in literature is inherently localized. And two, all such knowledge is never local or provincial. Uh, let me speak in abstraction now. Uh, Dr. Adi, I mean, do I have about 10, 15 minutes more? Huh? Yes, you have about 10 minutes more. Oh, okay. I will now speak abstractly about the pleasures and pain of translating the story. And this is what I mean by abstraction. Cholera College is a novel of events. And by this, I speak not of the virus, which is an event, uh, but of the event-like character of the main experiences reported in the text as singular, uncoded, unplanned, and yet productive of consequential ramifications. As an event, the cholera outbreak has no grammar, no syntax. It simply just endures, continues on and on. How should we name the difference between what I call an event and uh, what is not an event, or an, uh, what I call an act. I propose we render one category as cliche or act, virology, press conferences, cabinet meetings, dinner preparations, political campaigns. I want to call those acts because they are programmed, they are coded, and they can be planned. Then acts that break out in ways that could not be called accidents or mishaps, like the cholera itself, and existing conventions of containment proving sufficient, 
I refer, I want to suggest that we call Ishele, that is event. In the writing of the disaster in Cholera College, and I'm referring to Blanchot here, the writing of the disaster, a catastrophe breaks out in the wake of missed time. Then in the Yoruba, is the Yoruba expression adopted. Catastrophe breaks out in the wake of missed time. Uh, I have adopted that, that saying, Len Kete Nibin Shele, to translate that, the observation that Kete is the term for promptness or and convention. Kete, if it's not prompt, if it's prompt, then it's Kete. If it's not, then it's in trouble. That which obtains in time and place with or without regard for the considerations of will and of thought, even if open to anticipation, is denoted as Ishele in Yoruba language, Yoruba meta language. When the event is disastrous and beyond anticipation, or the effect is catastrophic, then it is Ajalu or Ijamba. This is not to say that the incidental or the accidental does not have or do not have causes. Grammatically, Ishele does not attach to a verb of subjective accomplishing in my region of Yoruba. For example, sub subject, humans don't achieve Ishele. You don't make Ishele. You don't invent it. You don't create it. You don't die Ishele. That is to say that there is no equivalent of eventuate in Yoruba. The event in Yoruba, in my understanding, as I read, is uninventable. The event is uninventable because it is not subject to will. Happenstances that are invented are Ishe, acts that are made, and when malefic, do not keep to propitious time. In everyday speech, the Ishele event or occurrence just happens. Shele occurs. Or to speak in Yoruba English, it sprouts from the soil. Ushe, uh, earth or ground. Ishele is neither the rot, the mate, or eda, or the created nor the duplicated or rep reproduced or a da. Ishele is neither a da nor a da. It is also not an originary act. Ishele is not Isheshe. Ishele is that, that is event, which I learned from, which I extrapolated from a short physicist's cholera college. Event is that which could not be deliberately made to occur like conventional produced practices including festivities, festivals, inowo or cost bearing. And here now for the next just one or two minutes, I want to, to round up on, on the question of uh, the question of uh, of meta language, how meta language can debar access to correlation. For me, the main problem for analysis arises from the character of Eton in Yoruba, the narrative. Unlike the analytical traditions passed through from, from the Greeks, the forward motion, inexorable forward motion of beginning, middle, and end, you know, those times they taught us in literature classes, uh, do not quite translate safely in the Yoruba language, in the Yoruba meta language of narratives. Because in Yoruba, the relation of progression is not as important as the relation that obtained between locations of events, all of which are often figured as parts of a body that need not be kinetic, that need not be moving. For example, in the cluster of Yoruba times I'm referring to, movement subsists in Ori, the head. ED, harbors causation, which is the buttocks. And the buttocks, are, causation is not a beginning because it's the buttocks. And ese, ese, that is the feet, trods Ori's directions. Let's think about these analytical complications as we get to the question and answer. Within this family of terms, I'm suggesting I'm about to round up here. The cause, that is ED, which is also the bottom, is neither a temporal beginning nor a, nor a physical tip, but a mid-body location that need not be a source or origin or point of emanation. ED is a part of a body or causativeness, like other terms, but it is not topographical, not referred to a location or land. Ori aggregates direction, that is the head, and is not charged with leading it or cutting out a path. While that position in grammatical terms could be occupied by a subject, you have Olori as the head or header or leader, the part that holds causation, ED, 
does not, as one would have expected logically, have an equivalent subject to copaya. Say Onidi, there is no Onidi, but you have Olori. Instead, the management of time, be it as causation or as consequence, anteriority or posteriority, is designated topographically and not somatically, not on the body, as any or the back. And that location could be occupied by a subject or a lay. This particular distribution of narrative time and place topographically and somatically implies that direction or ori need not derive from cause, ed. Direction does not derive from causation. Uh, and if you have read uh, uh, Oshofisa's cholera college, you know why this has been bothering me for the past 30 years or so. But this is the most recent explanation I've been able to give myself in, given uh, in the story that I've read that I could not leave uh, alone. And I'll end with this sentence. It is significant that culmination or queen is an abstracted terminus that is distinguishable from consequence, any back, end, anterior, or posterior. A narrative pursuit or inquiry that reaches a contingent terminus refers to one that has, that has exhausted the fund of relations available at a particular enactment. But even then, it cannot be implied with certainty that the seeker or the narrator has fathomed the ED. In other words, reaching an exhaustion, exhaustion point does not entail that a cause has been established. Narratives can trace the feed track in the process of discovery, and they can lead to a terminus that is not synonymous with the cause. Neither the directing apex nor the causative bottom denotes a centripetal force. As a structure of knowing and dissemination that is related to, but not dependent on the event or, or what has come to pass, the culminating head or ori and the fund of relational possibilities that constitute causes, ed, that co-inhabit the narrative body renders events knowable. Without the event, without the narrative, the event, as well as is being known as such, is an acephalous object, kolori, konidi, without buttocks too, to sit on, and also without legs, kolese, to move about or to stand on. I will end here and wait for questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Adeko. That's a very exciting, actually very stimulating uh, lecture, you know, taking us all the way from decolonization to the area of translation and interpretation and adaptation, you know, cross-language interdisciplinary work. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your contribution to this. Um, we should take the second lecture now, but before we do that, I know so many people may want to have questions. So we just take two, two questions, and then we go to Professor Evioroma, and then we come back to Professor Adeko later to take more questions for the others. So um, a question here from uh, Professor Akin Adeshokan of uh, Bloom, uh, Indiana University. It says, thanks for this stimulating talk. The contrast between Ishe act and Ishele event is very suggestive. Within this somewhat tight contrast, how would you respond to the assertion, immediately obscure, that happenings like COVID-19 are periodic means that systems such as capitalism devise to sustain themselves and are thus presented as natural. And add to that, the so-called naturalism of free enterprise. <laughs> uh, you're muted. You want me to respond to Aki now or wait later? Yes, please, if you want to, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, well, uh, one of the things I noted, which I did not have, I was cutting short, uh, was the uh, COVID-19 as Ishele and COVID-19 as Ishe. As a virus, COVID-19 has an etiology. 
It has a vector. You can trace it. It's not, these are highly educated people at the university. They can, they know the causes of cholera. They know how to track it. They know how to control it. So that, that's cholera as an act, as an ishe. But when as an ishele, they all threw their hands into the air. That like the, it just keeps going on and on and on. And my explanation here is that I, I'm trying to, I created the binary so that I can explain things because they are also interlocked. In Cholera College, just to illustrate, mother country actually knows, actually has vaccines in Cholera College. I don't know if I can remember, or we remember that story. Mother country, uh, which I translated as Urile Ya uh, in, uh, in, the, in Yoruba, and not, actually we should call it Urile Ya because it's the source of suffering, but it's called uh, Urile Ya in the, in the book. Uh, the, the mother country has vaccines in large numbers, which means they could, stop, they could stop the epidemic, but they didn't stop it because they wanted to create Ishele. So Ishele, that is Ishele, once you experience it, and you put it into a story, then it becomes an Ishe. And there are many versions of Ishe. So I agree with Aki that yes, we could interpret a COVID-19 outbreak, the way it was, the way people related to it, the way it was turned into a global, uh, as if the whole world was going to end, uh, as the Ishele present, they presented it as Ishele. Whereas ordinarily, they soon later, quickly, within 18 months, they now came up with a RNA vaccine, which you now convert it into an Ishe. So once Ishele breaks out, it becomes an Ishe. Because if it's not put into Ishe, you won't be able to cognize. You won't be able to know to know what it means and explain it. And that's what I that's what I've told myself, the similarities I found between COVID-19 and the way I will explain, I will answer to uh, Akinsha and Akin additional answer right now. He deserves a long answer, much, much longer answer, but I know him, so I know where he lives. So I can always pursue him, yeah. Okay, you know where he lives, it's a promise, not yeah. a threat. No, it's yeah. not, yeah. Yeah. Just, actually, yeah. it's a threat, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, just one more <laughs> question. And this one is from Professor Funcho Aijino uh, from Trinidad. It says, in your concept of causation and ED, yeah. what do you think of the concept of yeah, uh, you are right, Prof. So uh, the essay only follows the path that essay treads. Uh, Ori being the aggregation, being an aggregation, cannot does not cut a path by itself. Ori cannot cut a path. Uri cannot work by itself. That, for example, we are told that the place we call head, you must not use as, stump, you must not stomp the ground with it. The, the part of the body with which you stomp the ground is the essay. We cut, we cut parts through uh, with essay, but it's at uh, the direction of Uri, but also in collaboration with the buttocks causation, which is not at the head. So the point I'm trying to illustrate there is that if you listen carefully to meta language in Yoruba, in Yoruba, it's not going to be easy. For, if you follow it letter to letter, it does not allow easy access to Oshofison or to English language. And I'm trying to respect, to elaborate what Ishola was doing, that Ishola's argument, Ishola's call, that we must repopulate the ecosystem. And one of the ways you can repopulate the ecosystem is to heed the kind of warning that Ishola was giving that we must pay attention to some things beyond language. But at the same time, I'm at, I'm at home with a song, Olani Pekun song, that Greek conduct, he found similarities that every knowledge, every literary, literary knowledge can never be local, even if you localize it. So that's what I'm trying to balance. and. That's what I, 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 on one time I want to reflect what the relation between essay and Ori 
and ED tells us about narrative, how to make narratives in Yoruba, which I think Cholera College does. I've not seen any book that does it better at the level of self-consciousness. I've not read any narrative that's close to it. But at the same time, acknowledge that, yes, it's time to, Yoruba imagination is at play here, but at the same time, it's not in Yoruba. That's what I'm trying, I was trying to explain, trying to balance. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Adieko. And we, I know some other people who have questions for you. I can see that even uh, Dr. Uh, Ujutola, Ade Ujutola has a question for you and so on. And thanks, thank you also from Professor Ejina and Ade Chokon. Uh, we'll still come back to you and for more questions, but now we have to go to our second uh, lecturer, Professor Mibel Everema. And, I, and this is where I have to make a uh, make a, um, a, an apology to, because we have a technical problem, we can't get the video to work. It's, I'm sure it's not the problem of Abuja, it's probably something with, to do with my system, but- she, she's, I'm there to... so she's there now. She's there now. Oh, okay, so I should yeah. stop the apology. I'll stop the apology. <laughs> okay, right. Professor Bebel Everoma, as I earlier explained, is the, uh, past director of Center for Gender Security Studies and Youth Advancement, University of Abuja, Nigeria. She obtained a doctorate degree in 1996 from U University of Ibadan when she studied under Professor uh, Femi Oshavison and actually became part of the family. Uh, she's also an alumni of the Galilee College in Israel. She's a qualified barista and attorney called to Nigerian bar in 2018. She's a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Letters and also the fellow of Society of Nigerian Theatre Artists, fellow of Nigeria Association of Nigerian Authors, and fellow of Center for African American Research Studies. Uh, our paper today is, I, I think I'm going to let her explain because it's part of our paper. Um, do, do you want me to share? Or are you going to share? Please share. Okay. Just a minute, I'm just getting the I'm ready to share. Okay, here we go. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, Saz. Good evening, Maz. Um, it's an opportunity to be here once more to honor um, a playwright dramatist who deserves the honor. If my memory doesn't fail me, this um, annual ritual commenced in 2008, where people would gather, look at the works of um, Professor Femi Oshofison and see how, you know, the issues of the moment could be extracted from the plays because one could, you know, consider writers and dramatists as prophets. Um, I started, just give me the permission to turn off the video so I'm not too self-conscious. Um, okay, thank you very much. I started this presentation by, you know, discussing how African dramatists query the erroneous posture that Africans had no form of theater. And it's good to note that a lot of theorists and critics have successfully debunked that stance. The uses to which plays are put by dramatists show that the blunder and inaccuracy in the racist stance as the display of context in drama show that 
African way of life could be staged using indigenous formats or formal staging techniques. And we know that Oshofison's plays, when, you know, made to come alive on stage, reflect these dual staging forms. And so, consciously or unconsciously, the plays pose queries to modern ways of life with many political undercurrents that reaffirm the African reawakening and bearing in decolonial, post-colonial, anti-modern or anti-colonial standpoints. And so the questioning of modernity via indigenous culture is distinct through woman-centered perspectives in Oshofison's plays. And in this context, we find women who spearhead the reaffirmation or affirmation using cultural indicators. These women are many. In fact, we could count almost a hundred of such women in Oshofison's plays. I've also tried to, you know, call out two words, expression and embodiment. By expression, I referred to plays by Oshofison that discuss issues, that highlight ideology, that bring men and women of ideas to the forefront of knowledge production or dissemination to highlight issues that affect humanity or the African continent. The next term is embodiment. Here we find performativity, we find action, dance, music, and many perform participatory indices that help us to focus not on the imperial stance or that monolithic approach at meaning, but seeing the diversities of ideas brought into play in action, in activity. And so using the women in the plays I've highlighted in this paper, I try to approach their questioning and how they affirm or reaffirm the decolonial. Again, African thought processes are used as paths through which the ideas of the women are further affirmed. I try to expose Oshofison's plays to a thought process like Ibu Anyindanda, Sanibotem, that no load is too heavy for the ants. We know that that signifies communalism. I focused on Ubuntu. I also talked about the Omoluabi factor or idea. Well, the different sides of decolonial approaches through the voices of women query modernity and constantly affirm the Afrocentric position. The place I assessed in this presentation do not indicate the whole of a Shofison's creative output or the totality of his um, focal premises. The plays dwell on racial cultural activism, the post-colony as they gauge modern ways and find them highly lacking in utility and relevance to Africa, its prospects as a continent and perennial challenges. Um, talking about the epidemic, for example, the continent was saved a lot of morbidity because there was the recourse to herbal 
medications. People went local and even sent some of these local recipes abroad for people to procure and conquer COVID. Oshokiso also succeeds in drawing attention to Yoruba anthropomorphism, deity demystification, and the populist mandate for a transformed society in action through ideas and embodiment. I used, I just, in passing, I just um, went, you know, off the tangent by talking about Cordelia, how it transects his plays as a different genre and how it intervenes because it's full of pride in culture and knowing that irrespective of who spearheads the decolonial idea, the heroes or the sheroes are used to focus on this point, to adumbrate the points made above. That no matter who is the arrowhead of an idea, the end matters the most, despite the processes undergone. And so we find him sometimes using lunatic characters, characters in rags, the way Euripides would you know, dress some of his characters, young characters or you know, personalities we gauge as, you know, inadequate. And so no matter who the character is in Oshofison's play, there is a message. I, I looked at a lot of works by Oshofison, but the construal beginnings that link his words to the decolonial, the post-colonial, the cultural is Sandra Richards' 1996 seminal work, Ancient Songs Set Ablaze, okay? Where she provides an indexical approach, a pointer to the indigenous and therefore a decolonial slant in Oshofison's works. And so from the header by Richards, the reference ancient provides a lot of impetus as far as I'm concerned for what one is exposing in his works in the name of the Afrocentric and ancient in the way he showcases active and strong women. And so the playwright's declaration sometimes hardly affirms his intention especially if the opposite of his declaration is the case. E.g., he says Ajayi Crowder is not a historical document. And so what are the features of the decolonial that we can highlight in Oshofison's works? The two Nkroma plays are instructive in this regard, okay? We, we, we find three brothers, you know, and through them, the philosophy of Ubuntu is underscored, okay? And the multiplicity of the ideas or the universes or the pluriverse inherent in what they showcase, especially in a night with the elephant and Nkrumani, Africa, ni could be summed up in these nine points, okay? Such texts fight marginalization. And we know marginalization is an umbrella word. Sexual, political, economic, etc. They unlearn Western racist or cultic epistemologies knowledge systems that would want to let in a few and exclude others, okay? Reduce the dependency or the dependence on Western imperialistic thought processes. I thank diasporic writers who have, you know, thrown up the necessity 
for indigenous knowledge production and consumption. That informed my, you know, dragging into the works of Oshofison, Ibuayin Danda, Buntu, and Omoluabi. These texts eschew monolithic approaches. In Africa, we believe that one road hardly leads to the market or to the marketplace. And so monolithic approaches of seeing something through imperialistic lens or even seeing, you know, culture and tradition or even modernity from the perspective of Europe or America. And then they enable sundry meaning-making approaches or pluralism. Furthermore, there is the showcase of multiplicities of realities through adaptation or metatext. And one major success that Oshofison's creativity achieves is in selling the Yoruba worldview to the universe or to the pluriverse. We are not talking about translations or transliterations. We should focus on performances. Is it Yoruba names? Is it the exposure of Yoruba gods and goddesses onto the global stage? And so meaning making becomes you know, an embodiment or an expression of what Oshafison is trying to say. I've not had the courage to mention FO, so let me just be saying Oshafison. I don't want a knock on my head. And then um, the text interrogates the fringe center dichotomy in world systems, okay? And they also affirm equity in racial identity and relations. Such ideas are many. And like we've been told before now, the decolonial is not decolonization. They are different. Therefore, racial identity, racial relations are put on a pedestal that you know, draws attention to equity and equality. Um, the queries of modernity, you know, are also focused on where revisions, neo postulations along several lines, along theories, along cultural producers of knowledge or processes are brought, you know, to the forefront of what needs to be seen as decolonial. And so modernity cannot be privileged over indigenous approaches, especially those approaches of performance, of language that, you know, Africa relied on for several centuries or that sustained Africa for several centuries. And so African languages thrive in his place. He subjects the modern to further tests by proving that indigenous systems can also cross the temporal sense of modernity in architecture, spiritual systems, painting, music, sculptures, okay? centuries before the imperialists or colonialists came or before Western hegemony was, you know, foisted us. The multiple construct approaches can be seen. And on that slide, we see a lot of Oshofison scholars, okay? Books, you know, Theses, dissertations, essays, newspaper articles. And the critical interpretations expose further the 
categorization of FOs plays as ideological plays of expression, plays of cultural embodiment, history, morality, mediated faction or fiction of adaptations, the autobiographical, the futuristic among others. And so when women query the modern ethos, we see that such women are strong. They are not considered as vessels, phallic vessels or receptacles. They are shown as women with brains and more. Women who are able to confront patriarchy, white patriarchy or African patriarchy. And the department of seeing, you know, colonization as denuding the African woman's strength. This is, a, this is a dialectical posture because there are critics who say that colonialism, you know, affirms the strength of the African woman, while others believe that it took away from the strength of women. And so ideologies would, you know, be Marxism for decades. Oshofisa, you know, carried that gap, that body of being a Marxist playwright. But further rereading of the plays would prove more ideological basis, you know, in those plays. Um, the individual on Oluwabi or moral approach to interpersonal relations will be seen in a character like Ajayi Crowder and his granddaughter. These are people who are seen to epitomize the gentle, manly, and the ladylike approach. With a knight with the elephant, we see the questioning of African politics by Andre, a woman. A feminist critic would be, you know, happy with her shopping song in the way Andre was, you know, you know, drawn in her character department in the first few minutes of the play. But eventually we see that she is a committed ideologue who is able to interrogate African politics, African governance, and even put Sekuture on his toes. Her questions show that she is the voice of caution to these politicians. And what are some of these questions? And when will it end then? All the bloodshed. After the NLC, who next? Their families, their friends, what of their collaborators? And after this, can you tell me where it will end? Fine, go on then with the killings. This is a recurring decimal in African politics. And through the voice of motherhood, and through the voice of a woman, the outburst enable us to look at the arguments that would have arisen from the discussion of the leaders, because of course they denied the killings. And so the logicality of the woman, of Andre, tells us that it's a means of querying the colonial influence in toppling democratically elected government. The case of Patrice Lumumba is a point of note. And so, like I said, the philosophy of Ubuntu, as highlighted by Ramosi is a vista of friendship across borders, faith systems to enthrone 
communalism or Ubuntu. In Tegoni, we see similarities between the original text, but in its adaptive form, the women, Yemoja, a goddess, Kumbi, Yemisi, and Faderera, are able to challenge the governor's edict, are able to talk back to the empire, and even her marriage to Alan, the white district officer, in former times would have been, you know, conceived as mixagenation. But through that, Oshofison reverses dominance using the woman. And when the marriage is fought on both sides, from the governor's side and from the people's side, he insists that what is made evident are oppressive strangers who are allowed into any system and who intentionally topple such systems using race, using class, using power. And so here we see ask the question, who could have known that this is what our world would come to, that our guests would want to usurp even our rights? And Kumbi says, of what use is life anyway without honor? Are we here just to breed children and children who will be cowards too? You conquered us, so make the rules. We know our lives are in your hands and we've resigned ourselves. What more do you want from us? And then Tegoni's, you know, backlash. Shut up and listen, historian. Why do you think it will matter to me? If you wipe out our town, what you've done already to our men and to our pride, is that not sufficient damage? When our souls are in bondage, what does it matter again? What happens to our carcass? You are going to die. And I don't care if your queen herself leads the entire British army down here. This is talking back at the empire and using the figure of the head of the institution to, you know, highlight what I consider to be decolonial. So apart from this individual, you know, um, queries. We also have a shopping on using group dynamics. What, you know, several critics in the past referred to as the populist approach, the mass approach, the massification approach. And so the communal uprising and bold insurgency of the women is reminiscent of innocent Asuzu's Ibuayin Danda that I mentioned um, earlier on because when the people resort to the idea that no body is too heavy for them to bear, as long as, you know, talking back to the governor, talking back to the queen, talking back to the empire, the governor only laments. I sense the dawn of a new enfeebled age, the first awful premonitions that all we have struggled to build here and all over the world may one day come to naught. And of course, we are approaching that Eldo Radu. The last play is Ajayi Crowder. And um, one would try to see a Shafi song, you know, hinging on the philosophy of John Locke, you know, that sees slavery as barbaric, as a very low form of cultural enterprise. It is here that I try to counter Oshofison where he says that the work is not a historical document. 
But for us in the theater, it's a piece of history, a piece of theater history, a piece of historical truth that brings up the female characters like Susan Crowder, Imam Macaulay, and Hannah. I even the woman saved from ritual sacrifice to, you know, counter whatever postures, whatever, you know, degrading postures, racist postures they had against Ajayi Crowder in becoming bishop, in trying to use the play to clear Ajayi Crowder's name. And so Oshofiso makes a revolutionary out of Ajayi Crowder and uses the women to set the African church free by proving that a man of the cloth could also be thermostatic. A man of the cloth could also be used to challenge racial bigotry. And so in concluding this, um, presentation. It is my view that Oshofison deliberately underwent the process of knowledge production for radical liberation of African minds by also breaking the shackles of mental slavery in propelling us to look, to look at alternatives to the thought processes with which his plays could be underscored. And so whatever emanates from Africa via this presentation is considered telling and worthy of attention and emulation. We cannot gloss over the questions by Andre through with the issues of power, disempowerment, Africa and African knowledge in terms of governance, you know, are disdained at home and abroad. And so leadership by men or women is important. Therefore, by setting the African imagination free, Oshofison makes it legitimate and tells us that many universes coexist and intertwine, and that it's not just the modern that we should constantly focus on. And that part of freedom, the indices of freedom that he imagines in this text, that he expresses and embodies on stage, erupts, erupts constantly when he places side by side adaptations from Africa with original texts by Sophocles, Euripides, William Shakespeare, Wallace Shoinka, J.P. Clark, Brecht, Frisch, Fugard, Dickens, and Gogol, among other writers. And as far as I'm concerned, these queries persist and they continue to enhance African drama and theater using indigenous ethos and women as voices for more global capture of the decolonial. As he turns 77, I believe that his pen is not rested and it is my wish that he would engage in more futuristic and experimental projections that have proved writers to be clairvoyant and that these will be more evident in his future play to affirm the decolonial embodiment and express decoloniality in his plays. And so to quote Amaya Kwerejazu, the ultimate truth of one world, one reality, and one universe is also 
is also a myth by showing how it has hidden many worlds, many realities. And so in exposing the different words in his plays, we see that the query of modernity would continue. And from my personal perspective, it is from the angle of women who approach this text and highlight that which is decolonial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Everoma. Uh, I know I'm going to, I mean, that's, there's a lot to unpack in what you've uh, lectured. And uh, I'm going to bring in Professor Deco, but before then, you have one question here from uh, Professor Rashid Lehman from uh, of, um, Amadou Melo University in Nazaria. Says, thank you, Professor Mebel. The pandemic cl clearly showed that there is really no Western dominance of ideas, except in terms of economic disparity. Can we use dramatic themes to address African economic poverty? Culturally, dramatists such as Oshofison have driven their point. Is it not time we address poverty and its causes in Nigeria and Africa? Thank you. Um, thank you for that question. Poverty is um, an issue in the continent. Um, when I tried to write down that question, a play came readily to mind, Once Upon Four Robbers. Apart from Once Upon Four Robbers, Twingle Twangle, A Twining Tale. Apart from that, Moron Todu and the Agbekoya Uprising, uh, even Women of Oru, you know. A lot of his plays talk about poverty. And it's not now that dramatists started to focus on poverty. It's been with us. And recall that I talked about his future plays. And so such plays should challenge trade agreements, the WTO, um, the, the inspection of goods or the rejection of goods from Africa. And by the time discussions on the lack of balance in trade and how they influence the poverty of the black man and they are you know embodied on stage it's my opinion that you know a very fertile discussion would emanate from this plays have focused on sap you know a, a lot of plays have talked about you know how environmental degradation, you know, leads to poverty in Nigeria. So it's, it's an assignment, it's an agenda for the celebrant dramatists, you know, to look at the politics of poverty, to look at the African political economy and how the characters, for example, Nkrumah, um, Amilcar Cabral, in his return to the source, or how Europe underdeveloped Africa, or the wretched of the earth, you know, Augusto Boal and his ideas, you know, linking them to all these uh, global economic agreements and how they affect us. The Adire fabric wouldn't have much local standard in international markets. And here in Nigeria, we have a lot of bossy corner. Apart from bossy corner, we have a lot of, you know, fabrics that are alien to what we are and who we are. These are embedded in a lot of his plays, I know, but I just mentioned those ones. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Mibel Everoma. Um, now, this is that section of the symposium where we bring the two uh, uh, lecturers, uh, we spotlight them. And I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion going on in the chat. And if you want to bring, if anybody wants to bring those discussions now to the main forum, or if anybody has, has any other question, um, Professor Folabo, uh, Ajayi Shoinka has a question uh, to Professor Adeleke Adeko. The dichotomy posed between Ori and Ese appears to ignore the complexity of the Ori concept in Yoruba construction of knowledge and beingness. It also complicates for me your reference to binary, which I find too limiting and actually a European power construct. How do you respond to that? Yeah, okay. uh, thanks, uh, uh, Professor uh, Ajayi. Uh, in terms of binary, I don't see it as Western uh, as such. Uh, I see it, I read this concept as devices of carrying out analysis uh, that need not be Western by nature. Uh, for example, we can speak of binarism, deep binarisms in Yoruba societies, uh, Ori, Ese. But I complicate it by including a D, that is a D, especially when we speak of narrative, uh, and that they do not create a progression as we, normally, as we are normally taught in narratological theories of how stories progress or not progress. Uh, Ori, Idi, and Ese, and Iwaju, Eni, uh, front, back, they relate differently. So Ori and S are two ends, but there is a D in between. A D that is a causation, but it's not the source. I find that really, really intriguing. Uh, in terms of, I've not, I'm still working on it, but I started looking at those in thinking about Cholera College, an absurd story. One of the most frequent terms used to describe the book is that it's an is a, a, a narrative of absurdity. Yeah, that's what, and I'm trying to, is, is in Yoruba thinking about stories, are narratives essentially absurd in the way that Uri, Essay, and ED are complicated? And to speak of, of binary generally, uh, Ibi, Ire, I've read many, many, I've read some things about Yoruba writers who say Ibi and Ire they always work hand in hand. Uh, hmm. the, the, the work hand in hand does not mean that they're the same. Uh, that, they, that we always see them together does not mean that they cannot be, the, the, be separated if only for analysis. So that's, that's where, uh, it's the complication that I'm really interested in, the real complication for analysis. And, do you want to come back to that, uh, Professor Ajayishwenka? Well, um, he says he's working on it, and, and it's something that we all have to explore further. Because I think, I mean, we are talking of the, the colonia, we're talking of modernity, but um, so these are things that affect us that affect um, traditions, indigenous language, but then we are not static either. And that would be my second question to Professor Ev Ev Everoma. Everoma, thank you. I, I'm still constructing that, please go ahead. <laughs> I, I accept temporarily your explanation. And like you said, we are all working through it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Professor Bell, do you want to answer that question? The question to you. Oh, she says, what's the She's question? Muted. She's muted. She was muted. Okay. Could you repeat the question now? Sorry, please. 
me? Yes. Could you oh, repeat yes. the question? Oh, okay. The, the one I posed for Professor uh, Adeko, for you exactly. Okay, um, related to that, and in, in um, from what you said, is that I also, I mean, you did say that um, there are two schools of thought on the impact of colonial trauma on uh, women's position in Nigeria in Africa in general. Yes, you know, we have that issue of double patriarchy. Um, but it seems, and I may be wrong in your presentation, it seems that, uh, because you, at one point you said indigenous knowledge, modernity, does it mean that we are static? Uh, indigenous knowledge is static? Because I, again, I, I question that. Um, we keep moving forward. We keep revising and borrowing and adapting. Even before colonization, we borrowed from each other. We, adapt, uh, we adapted um, systems of knowledge, ideas, and we make them our own. If you study IFA, you know, you can see this, uh, the uh, divination system. Um, so, um, so in the issue of women, yes, we've imbibed some negative aspects of womanhood from the European colonization, but we also have ours and we have mix them up. And that's what I mean that we are not static. We keep even when we refer to indigenous knowledge, yes, we need to look at what um, are laudable in our forms of knowledge, construction, production, and in practicality. But we also need to, to update. Uh, you, you are right. It's that need for audit that um, the decolonial perspective throws up, that, that there should be some form of assessment of our past ways and our present ways. And mm -hmm. in revising whatever we have, they should be placed side by side modern views. And that the modern views should in no guise be seen as superior to ways of life that stood the test of time for centuries. Our language, our dressing, our, you know, that was what I meant by referring to quotidian ways of life, yeah. our architecture, you know. And so where the positive ones are held up for imitation, for practice, I believe that gradually would, you know, shift from that focus on all that is European is better than whatever is African or whatever is local. And that made me, you know, to provide the example of COVID. Mm -hmm. Our dietary systems too, even the proverbs in many of our plays tell me that we had thought systems that were able to guide us to have material and non-material aspects of culture that stood the test of time. Why would libraries be burnt by colonialists or imperialists? Why would artifacts that link us to a very scientific past, you know, be denigrated. And then that which, you know, they want us to buy through a monolithic, you know, um, pathway will now be forced upon us. The decolonial, you know, is an idea that I encountered recently. I've always, you know, read about post-coloniality and, and the like. But I, 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 I seem to like the decolonial because it has to do with the mental process. 
it's a it's a practice that is focused on our thinking. So, for example, I don't think when I stand beside that which I don't understand very well, I should run to you know the advertised or the popular because it's from across the Atlantic. And so indigenous wisdom would push one to that which is familiar, that which stands the test of time, and that which, you know, when the Europeans encountered in the 15th and 16th centuries, when they came to Africa, they respected. But because of political hegemony, they downplayed or they trampled under their feet in order for their ideas, you know, in order for an upsurge of their ideas. And so creativity may be the last frontier, you know, for us to, you know, show up whatever ideas we have through plays for the younger generation to know that these things, some of these things have African origins. Some of these things are actually at home with us. On a particular platform, a, a, a professor asked the class about Amata Aidu, and none of them knew her. And it's unfortunate because someone now remarked that many of them know more about America than about Africa. And that's why the translations, the transliterations, the adaptations that are being done should continue. And in fact, um, like the focus on cholera college, you know, using the Ori uh, essay and the D triad would go a long way in exposing, you know, us to look at ways of, you know, assessing these epistemological things or whether they are what we teach in the class or what we try to believe in. Gone are the days when many would think that um, whatever is African is fetish. Those days are gone. COVID made us to look inwards, to look at our dressing, to look at, you know, our diet, to look at, you know, our, 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 our ways of, you know, expressing communality of being a brother's keeper. And so the three philosophical ideas will be further, you know, examined to see how we can hold up that which is indigenous as knowledge systems or as ways of life for, you know, better um, creativity and criticism. Professor Ayedino, I'm not a character that worked out on her author. I'm still with my author. I'm not working you, out. You sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Madreja, if you, if, you, if you will allow me to come in at this point, please. Yes, yeah, indeed. That's why I've uh, spotlighted you. Okay, so, okay you know. thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate um, Falabo's intervention there about modernity and uh, the fact that um, Africa has always been uh, modern and we always have to remember that in whatever we do. But my uh, question, I just want to uh, throw a spanner in the works uh, here that each time we're talking about colonial, decolonial, post-colonial, we tend to forget that that whole process started even before the white man came to Africa. The Yoruba people were very colonial. They dominated other people and imposed their will on other people. And we always have to take that into account. And not just the Yoruba people, I'm, I'm just using that as an example. Uh, the Hausa Fulani and all of them were also very, very colonial and we have to take that on board. And the other is, so I'm throwing it there for those of you who are researching this area to be constantly aware 
that when we talk about colonialism and decolonialism and postcolonialism, we're not just talking about the West. We're talking about in, in, in internal relationships in Africa too. The other issue I want to uh, 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 throw in the works is um, I kind of uh, you take off from something uh, Professor Roma said about uh, uh, ideologies. Uh, most times we talk about our writers in terms of Marxism and so on. And some of us who are classified as Marxist, and I put up my hands here, I have never read a single word about Marx. I relate to our society the way I think it should be and the way I think the, the, the future I think we should see in front of us. So I don't need no Marx to tell me that um, oppression is oppression. I don't need no Marx to tell me that um, when uh, our leaders are not working according to the best interests of the people, they are our enemies. I don't need Marx to tell me that. My father told me that. My village told me that. So we always have to be careful when we are trying to uh, tag our writers with foreign uh, terms and so on. I don't know how Marxist um, Femi Oshofisson is. He's here with us. Uh, he can tell us if he, was, if he so wishes. I approach our society from the point of humanity and what humanism demands that we should do for ourselves. So what I'm saying here is just to say that um, in our research, we should also try to go as far back as possible. But I have specific questions for Professor Adeko. The whole concept of any as the back, but we also have to understand any as the future, any land road, as the future. Although it's a kind of back too, it's a few, but it's a future back. So if you're going to inter interpret that term, uh, please bear that in mind and see how you're going to uh, put that into your, uh, your theory. And the theory of progression and location that you mentioned, I think you also um, need to expand on it. You didn't have the time to expand on it. So I wasn't sure where you were going with um, progression and location. Um, and so I, I don't want to prejudge you. I'm just uh, saying that um, I would love to see the expanded um, analysis of that whole concept before I can say I agree or disagree. So those are my two cents. Thank you very much, moderator. Thank you, Thank you Professor. So, Professor Diego. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with what uh, Professor Eugenio just said regarding where I am on time and progression. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things that, that I'm trying to confront at the same time here. My, one of the things I always do in my own work is when I take, I always take our writers very, very seriously. It doesn't matter whether they are, that they are African, does not mean that uh, I, I treat them just like me. They are more, they are more, far more intelligent than me. All those writers I write about, and I try to understand them, bring all my own knowledge, Western and non-Western, to understand their own Western and non-Western being, as they were. So, and that's what I was trying to do with. I've been dealing with Cholera College. It was a chapter in my PhD dissertation in 1991, a chapter in my first book. Uh, I just keep going, but I can't leave the book alone just because of the, innovate, the clear innovation that I found uh, uh, in, the, in the book in terms of narrative. And how do I justify that in an African Yoruba context? What, where is the beginning in that book? Where is the end? Which one is any? As you said, any as time, any as location. Uh, and in terms of thinking of time in Yoruba language, I'll, I usually say language instead of culture because I find it, I find culture a little dicey because it's slippery when we say culture when we are referring to only specific practices at the point in time. But I'd rather say language because language stretches and it has this diachronic element in it that you just keep repeating over and over. That's why I always speak of language as opposed to culture. In terms of modern and non-modern, the indigenous, as far as I'm concerned, is an invention of the modern. Uh, 
in uh, tradition is an invention of modern. The traditional did not invent the modern. And I always keep that in my mind. Same thing as orality and literacy. The lit it's literate folks that invented the oral folks. And I'm, not, I, I'm not alone in this. I took that from the late Aladi Yai, which was a critical part of his work that was neglected. He was really engaged. He said, look, we need to keep questioning ourselves with these terms. So in terms of any back, any as uh, space or time, it connects largely to the way back and forth of concepts in Yoruba language. Uh, Egbo, for example, just to give another example of that time and other complications. When you speak of Egbo, you need not be my, uh, my blood relative for me to call you Egbo. Egbo is a relationship of how we locate. Yeah. Mm. Uh, when we say, uh, when we say uh, Yale, another one from feminism, before many scholars. Yale, the first, the older wife, need not be chronological oldest, is the first to arrive in the patrilocal, in the, in the locality of the, of the males, that women who came from other places to this household. So when we say Yale does not mean the mother, it's the mother of the household. It refers to age, it also refers to senior, seniority or time and also location where you are, you cannot be Yale, for example, in your father's house. And you cannot be Bali in your, in, your, in your wife's household. So again, location, time, when we move. So it's those complications that allow me to not want to speak of culture, but also tease out where I can. Sometimes they cannot, we cannot generalize. It's not possible. When I see all the, all the many issues, it's difficult for me to generalize. But I always try to bring it back to the issue of language. On any time, I think Kole Odutola also asked that in the so doesn't it, when we say doesn't a story have a back? Yes, as Dr. Eugene just reminded us, he is much older than us, so he knows this. That when they tell you, Oma Lenyo, this world is going to have a back. Does that mean that there is no back already, or that it's a different kind of back that is going to one that comes before in terms of time? one that comes after. So it's no longer location, it's now, it's now the body in location at a particular time. So again, like I said, I'm still working this out, but the issue of tradition and modernity, I've settled myself, I've cleared my mind on that. On decoloniality and decolonization, I've adopted Femi Taiwo's attitude that uh, it is against decolonization. Not that decolonization is bad, but decolonization, as we think of it now, we have to keep reminding ourselves of African agency. What people that deep colonization is a tick in vast time. And I think Dr. Eugene was reminding us of that. Time is so vast, colonization was a tick, another talk, and we cannot get, if you get stuck on the tick talk of colonization, it's going to take us a long time to decolonize, as it were. So I take, I express, I prefer agency. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I wonder if at this time I should bring in Professor Sandra Richards. Professor Sandra Richards, yeah. one of the first uh, scholars to bring to fore the works of uh, Femi Oshofison um, with uh, ancient songs set ablaze, which she wrote after, in 1990, published in 1996 after uh, a spell at University of Benin in Nigeria. Uh, Professor Richards. Well, um, thank you for that shout out. Um, I'm very um, delighted uh, to be here. And really I'm here in the position, I regard myself in the position of a learner, <laughs> of um, getting um, up to date on some of uh, Chauvisson's later works and also, um, further familiarizing myself with um, some of the scholarship in the field. Um, I do appreciate um, the last comments um, about um, back, you know, and, and location and the concept of time because from, you now maybe I've misunderstood some of what has been said, um, but it's, but I guess I, um, 
would want to hear more about how um, indigenous knowledge keeps up with time, that indigenous knowledge changes over time. Um, because I think um, otherwise, and, and maybe this is just a misunderstanding on my part, that we may be um, suggesting that, um, that history or progression over time belongs to the West and um, um, indigenous knowledge traps us. In the West. And obviously um, that's, um, that's not the case. So um, I, I'm very delighted to be here. And I um, want to just take a moment to uh, greet Professor Shofisa on his um, approaching birthday. Um, and I look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emeritus Professor Richards. Um, before you respond, Professor De Adeko and uh, Everoma, I'm going to call on, because I did mention earlier that we, we're celebrating uh, Femi or Shefison, that's why we are doing this. And I know he probably would have wanted to stay in the background and not come up, but in the normal culture and tradition of stampeding, I'm bringing him here now to <laughs> say one or two words, either to comment on what has been said or to just say whatever, or maybe we can just sing happy birthday to him or whatever. So. Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. I just want to thank all of you for this um, very stimulating talk. Um, I guess people who are uh, not familiar with this work who know that you are all my friends. And so you are just <laughs> saying things that are complimentary. <laughs> Uh, I mean, from Sandra Richards, who I haven't seen for years. Um, um, to Olavo, Olavo, who is a naughty sister. Um, <laughs> we are allowed to use that. Very <laughs> uh, Mime, who is like, um, I don't know. <laughs> A sister, so um, I, I mean, I, I don't really know. Really. I'm still astounded by your interest in Colorado College. I must say, uh, I really, I'm really astounded by that. You know, to function, I just you know, was run away from here. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of you for for this symposium. I mean the purpose of writing is to stimulate discussion, to see whether our society can improve. Uh, sometimes, you know, um, we are brought, when we see the failures, to ask ourselves whether you know, there's any purpose in writing at all. Um, but this kind of symposium encourages uh, us, the writers, all of you um, to continue to do what we think we we we, we can do to stimulate people, to encourage uh, people to um, continue to struggle for a better world, um, and from various directions. It doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to be just economic alone. Um, changing the minds of people, you know, I think uh, it's very important. Mm, and I say this because nowadays the, the, the dramatic fashion seems to be dwindling. Um, there's less tension to theater than to film. Uh, all our students who come to the university uh, looking to be uh, stars uh, in the film, the film, not not in the theater. So, well, I thank you all, um, particularly uh, German and um, Shola, who are you know, naughty disciples, I think, um, 
But uh, I thank you all for coming and for, for this stimulating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Femi Oshofison. Um, many happy returns. Um, mm -hmm. I know I, I haven't given up on singing happy birthday song, but um, <laughs> the, the the next section is what I, we call the stampede. Are you waiting tomorrow to sing that? I think it's tomorrow not the actual birthday. Tomorrow is the actual birthday. But tomorrow we, we are showing plays. Let's mm. yeah, we can take a break to sing then. That okay. we'll right, sure. make sure we'll it's, make it's sure. It's already that tomorrow. Attends. It's already tomorrow somewhere on the planet. It's not okay. That's another point. But it's not yet tomorrow in Nigeria, <laughs> is it? Or in what I mean? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> We, we need to stampede now, so I need to call Kole Adi uh, Ujutola, Lagos Bobo, whose pen or fingers has been drumming on my computer, but whose mouth we need to hear from. Kole, where are you? Show your face. Uh, I think I, I turned on my, my video. You have to search for it. But you know, I'm, I'm really thankful to the two speakers, um, uh, Professor Deco and uh, Sister Mabel for bringing in these interesting ideas. There's one question I've always wanted to ask um, Professor Shofison, and it's very, I don't know whether it's simple or maybe the answer is complex. It, it's the fact that what does he want? What do you want from the Nigerian society? If you can articulate what you want from the Nigerian society, is there a way in which what you want can be attained or what you want for the Nigerian society is attainable? And um, it, it's always been at the back of my mind every time I remember the rehearsal of um, Urike and the Grasshopper. And um, the grasshopper, yeah. my, my mischievous self always tells me is the is this writer not explaining how he got into the guardian and, and started to work for um this rich capitalist person but it, it's always something that you've been told that in literary studies why don't you just pay attention to the text and don't drag in the extraneous uh life of a person so every time it comes to my head, I give myself a knock on the head that no, no, those, those two plays, Oriki of a Grasshopper, I think, or am I mixing it with Chattering and the song? But I remember quite well that um, Ohi Alegbe at some point was doing, you gave him that script and there was something in Benin and he was reading. And every time I read it, because The Guardian at that time, 83, 80, 84 was just starting and there was this, this character that looked like the person um, who had written the play. But let me not uh, distract you with that. The real main thing I would like to say is, what do you want from the Nigerian society? And do you think that what you want is possible? And if it is possible, in what ways can the famous officer 12 disciples um, help? Because I, I know two of them already. Um, I know two of the of the disciples. The, the good thing about both of them is that they have the letter A in their in, in, as part of their names. I'm not sure all of them would have letter A. But in the twelve disciples of um, Professor Femi Oshofison, how can they, or what agenda would you give to them to carry on as um, you go? But you have to articulate first. For us, what do you want? Well, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not a difficult uh, question to answer. What I want is exactly what you want. What do you want for society? I want a lot of money. <laughs> well, but you know, if you have a lot of money to be able to spend it and survive it, you have to have a good society. I will uh, uh, back it up. 
if you are if you are if you have a lot of money in a very poor society, you know that you will not if I enjoy it, you will also be in danger. You know, you be insecure. You know, if you if you, if you have that kind of money, and so you know we all want the same thing. You know, we want to have a good life. So uh, a place where we can function, where all our children can grow up happy and so on. We want the same thing. The point is that in what circumstances can you get that? You know, uh, if you are alone in a, in a, in a society, in a, in, let's say in a community, you are the only one who has a car, who has a, you know, you are never safe, you are never secure. You have to have, you know, within, a society where everybody is also happy, it's also uh, well provided for. And that's what we want. If one person wants to steal all the money, then we can't. We can't have a, a stable society. So that, 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 that's just it, you know. Um, I don't want anything more than what everybody who, you know, who is conscious of uh, what's happening in society wants, what everybody wants. When I went to join the Guardian, of course, there was a lot of problems, a lot of questions. How can you go and join a, a, you know, a paper owned by a bourgeois? <laughs> you know, and, you know, it was it was a big question. You know, how can you? Know, and everybody, most people said, well, don't go because they will they will destroy your radicalism. You know? But we went there and. Discover. I mean, I learned a lot. I learned a lot because, you know, it's, it's not sufficient to just be radical. You have to be radical within the context. And we had people on the Twitter board, you know, who had different opinions, and so, so you have to listen to them. And sometimes you discover that your view is not even possible. It's not right. It's not pragmatic. Your own view is just one view. You have to listen to others. And you know, that really changed a lot of things for me. You know, because you know, it's not only the radicals who are in society. Society is composed of so many other other people. And we have to get a consensus among us to show where we are going. So uh, that's it. I hope that answers your question. Uh, because you. Um, you know, we are still we are still in the battlefield, if you like. Um, of what is going to happen to our society. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Oh, just just a, a, a corollary to that, to call this question about the Guardian. Is that why you, the experience of the Guardian, is that what made you went even further metaphorical in your, and mythical in your writing? Because one of the works that came out of the garden was Twingle Twangle, a twiny tail. Why you now, did you decide Exactly, I mean, you see you know, that, you know, that you have a number of choices. And sometimes you think your own choice is the best. But when you now uh, argue with others, you see that your, your choice is not about to be the best. In any case, it has to be argued out with others. I mean, you know, it's all right to think that you are radical, you have a gun, you kill others. <laughs> but, you know, that will only endure for a while. You know, if you kill others, you, use, you know, impose force and so on. But that force itself will be questioned. It won't last. Um, we have many, many, many instances which we cannot go into now. You know, you enforce your position. But once people are not convinced, that position will not last, not endure. So uh, I think the, the, the where one of the traumatic is traumatic, but traumatic to me. One of the things I have to learn is that you know, change cannot come except gradually. When you are dealing with human society, we have is change will only come gradually as people come become convinced. You, if you have force, you can enforce your, 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 your ways, but that won't last. As long as, as soon as you lose that force, people will revert. If they are not convinced, you have to convince people. 
and that takes time. You have to organize, and that you know, also takes time. Most of our radicals, that's the problem. We have no time, no time at all, or we have no patience to organize, to convince people we want to force our ways on them, but it won't work. That's the thing, you know. I, I, I mean, it's probably disenchanting to think of that. But if somebody, for instance, if, if he has a headache, and you know that Fensic or Panadol is what we cure him, he may refuse to take it. And that may be because he has been, you know, maybe some religion has told him that that is not, and he will not take it. You can't persuade him, you know, I say, but this, this is what works, and he will not take it. And if he takes it, it will not work. That's just the point. You have to convince people. You have to take pictures to, to convince people and to organize. You know, most of our radical projects in Nigeria feel because you have the patience to organize. You just want to quick, quick, quick solution, but there's no quick solution when you're dealing with human beings. That's just the point. Well, anyway, I thank you all for, I mean, from play to play, I try to explore this, explore how we can you know, bring our societies, make them better, how we can you know, uh, defeat all the opportunities we make, we make sure that our society is backward because they profit from this. Uh, so from play to play, you know, I try to experiment as well. And I'm glad that um, uh, Adeleke Adeleko has uh, begun to translate some of them for me um, because we need to bring them close to the people. Uh, and um, even those of us who have been educated the wrong way, we have to relearn come back to our people, make sure uh, that they learn the right thing. Because it's not just culture, it's a culture because you're speaking Yoruba. But you're speaking Yoruba, it may be the wrong thing you're speaking. Um, which I have always uh, said, because most of the Yoruba, Yoruba dramas are so backward, so sexist. You know, uh, I mean, so uh, we have to really do something about this. You know. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I'm going to hand over to German at this point. Um, well, happy birthday, Prof. Uh, you were told that you mm -hmm. ran away. <laughs> but, but we'll be waiting for you. I, I think uh, that actually should be the <clears throat> last word of this function, but there was something Professor Ayajino said about writers and liberating which I think is still going on. I remember handling the literary series in those days, the do through that we had in terms of uh, debate about whether anybody wants to be labeled or not. I think that was a very strong point you made, but which uh, probably has escaped us now. I'm not sure, I don't know if uh, FO would like to respond to something like that. But again, uh, I think it would be unfair not to give Pelumi Fola Jimmy uh, a chance to mobilize uh, some of the things I and mean, vocalize what some of the things he has been saying if he, if he wants to uh, before we have to and then, uh, I think uh, we we'll still have to do happy birthday to Efo. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, if you want to uh, speak to the idea you've been uh, sharing yeah you can say it now so that we then can take the final word or any other person who wants to make any final can just let us know yeah yeah, okay. Professor Sholadi Yemi uh, had actually private chatted me, asking me if I have something to say. I told him I have said everything I wanted to say in the chat. Thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to talk. Thank you. Thank you. I think you can see your face now. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, is there any other person who wants to say something? We have less than 10 minutes. FO is still here. I want to say something, you know. Who is that? My name is Luke Sanisi. You are just coming face. in now. Honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm in Nigeria. I forgot. Yeah, say, you are, say, your, say your say. Say your say. <laughs> Otherwise, I go to court. <laughs> hey, Tiro. <laughs> First of all, Prof. FO. 
Happy birthday to you, sir. Igba Odu Konyo. Thank you for all the inspiration. Thank you for everything. Words of encouragement, sir. Thank you for taking me as your child. Thank you for all the uh, inspiring words and everything that you've ever done for me. And uh, we thank God for bringing you to our country, Nigeria, and for carrying the touch of literature for this country. And, this, yeah, and all your works have always been inspirational to me and to so many other people. And I wish, you know, we could celebrate you beyond this justice forum. You understand, sir? So I just want to say thank you. Thank God for giving you the beautiful life to share with us common uh, mortar. Because you are now a God among men. You are now a glory, sir. You are now everything, sir. God bless you, sir. And I'm so sorry. I completely forgot. Uh, I came to, I mean, Niger at the moment, secret on the secret service. But I just remember now that today is 15. So, so sorry, sir. I even, uh, I, um, I met Uncle Tunde Fag Bin Lee. Uh, I, I mean, I don't want to disclose it to everybody here. And we talked about your birthday today. So, uh, Shola and Ko, please, I'm so sorry for coming in late. I just remembered oh. now. I can't you show my signed already because as it is, I am working. All yes. right. So, bro, mm -hmm. happy Excuse birthday. Please forgive me. Sir. Sir. If I don't yeah. do concert. Yes, sir. I like, I like to say a word. Please, let me take uh, Wale Olugunle first, then I'll come to you, please. Wale Olugunle, please. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the privilege. Uh, to Dabo, because I read a bit about uh, Professor Fiso, and I learned that his first degree it was in French. And fortunately for me, uh, I am doing my PhD currently now in the US, French. Mm -hmm. And um, I would like to say one or two words to prof in French. Uh, prof, je vous souhaite uh, un joyeux anniversaire. Que le bon Dieu prolonge votre vie. Que Dieu vous bénisse. Et que vous restiez uh, le dernier dramaturge jusqu'à la fin de votre vie. Joyeux anniversaire. Bon anniversaire. Et à everybody. I just merci, 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 merci beaucoup. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Hello, merci beaucoup. Merci, merci. <laughs> uh, hey, someone, said, someone wanted to, to speak. Well, yeah, you're giving out the exam. I wanted that? to oh, speak. Oh, pull up. I can't you. Yes, you can thank you. Yeah, thank oh, you. Thank I just you. want to express my joy. I saw the notice for this uh, virtual meeting um, celebration That's a catchy. That's a catchy. Two, two days ago. And yeah, uh, a ago. I want to thank the organizers for organizing this event. We need to celebrate people who deserve to be celebrated. And uh, we need to celebrate them when they are alive. So I'm really happy about what is happening here today. And I want to wish Femi the best Many more uh, books are coming out from him, and he, God will give him granting good health and long life to do more for Nigeria. When he was speaking, I was just laughing because I said, "Here is a writer who lives and writes what he believes in. What he has said is exactly what we find in his books." Thank you, Femi, for being who, whom you are, and thank you for making Nigerian literature what it should be. Thank you. Yeah, may, I, may I respond quickly by thanking um, Akashi? Yeah, you can, you can, sir. Yeah, because Akashi is one of our foremost writers uh, and um, one of the, um, what I call, uh, the, the responses to Achebe. Achebe has been celebrated so much. But those who have responded to him in a very yes. strong way uh, okay. have not been celebrated as much. Uh, I want to thank Akachi for our friendship, for the work she continues to do. Um, recently, you saw her Abby. celebrating uh, uh, Ama uh, and dancing to it. I was very impressed by that. Thank you very much, Akachi. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Um, Rashida Liman, please, we have less than 10 minutes to go. 
Yes, I Even also want to add to, Thank you very much. I also want to add to what everybody else has said. Happy birthday, Prof. Uh, we thank love you. you. We appreciate you. Um, I joined in from maybe use area, so I'm representing my people <laughs> to say happy birthday to you. Uh, you've been an inspiration to most of us. In fact, uh, we appreciate you. We thank you for everything you've done. I uh, wish mm -hmm. you many, many more healthy and happy years. I had happy birthday, sir. Thank you very much. So I can take one or two more and then we we'll, we'll just wrap it up before we thank our speakers and then uh, do the birthday ritual. Anyone else? Hello? Okay. Hello? 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 Who is knocking? Wind up on you. Hey, wind up. <laughs> Hello, how I can't see it. Hello. You can't see me. See me. No. We can't see you. Oh, well, we're two, two. Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe. How are we? In we know. Happy birthday, bro. I listen to uh, for right from the beginning to the very end. I, I, I've written my chat there. I will have said much, but I don't I don't sabi English too much. So uh, what I want to say is prof, I'm inspired by you. Love your works. We've always been uh, when I want to see that with a small boy like this. I've always loved your works. I'm still loving your works. However, your new book that you said you've just released, we'd like to get it uh, in our small corner so that we can do uh, justice to it. As soon as possible. Love okay. you, bro. God bless you, sir. Let's go. Okay, no, it's on Amazon. It's amazing. <laughs> we. Okay. Who else? Just uh, otherwise, I want to ask uh, Professor Wilma and uh, Adia, because since you didn't have the chance to say happy birthday, if you want to say that now, in one one minute. And have we sang happy up. birthday to Prof? Have we all sang happy birthday song to him? Hold on, Mr. Lukman. We're coming to that. Right, G. Uh, you, okay. You want us to say happy birthday to Professor Shafiso? No, well, if you want to, uh, because you were the main speaker. So in case you want to say something, yeah. you, you well, didn't have a chance uh, to say that here. I, will, I, will, I happen not to, one of the things I, one of the, Fortunes I never got to enjoy was be Professor Shafison's student uh, ever uh, in a former classroom. But it has been a pleasure for me to read and teach his works. I remember when I first taught Cholera College at University of Colorado in Boulder about three decades ago, we actually had to use, I don't know if they paid you copyright fees. I made, I made the bookstore buy the copyright and actually add it to the to the that time they used to they used to uh, cyclo style them and put them in the bookstore. To be sure that they paid you, I made the bookstore actually contact Copyright Clearance Center. I don't know if they paid you or not, but mm, yeah, I, actually, I, I brought that up to show that the kind of respect that I've always had for your work and the kind of regard, high regard I always hold you, uh, uh, particularly the way you see things differently from your colleagues when they were rapidly Marxist, you are headedly Marxist uh, in my reading of your of your of your of your works. And I'm really happy I'm really I feel, I feel fortunate to have been able to to do that. Um, and I also well, I have to say this publicly when I asked for the permission to translate, he said go ahead. You didn't charge a penny for translating, although I didn't make a penny. I don't think the publisher does to so give. It's not too late. I can still accept. Okora, I see job, man. Thank you very, very much, and happy birthday, Professor. Thank you very much. Happy birthday to you, sir. Yeah. Mojuba, Prof. 
you know I'm always indebted to you. When the question on poverty came, I remember those years of poverty, the years of being an indigent student, where I was zealous, I wanted to learn. And trust teachers who notice that lima of wanting to know more, the part of students books and um, I've said this before during my master's years at UI my mom was a junior staff at maintenance department then um, couldn't you know foot the bill of tuition and books and you know uh, hostel accommodation and so when we had issues at um, Tafa Balewa Hall then Prof gave a diri adeda, now a diri udo, and I in voice quarters. And mommy would insist that we came to the house every Sunday. Sumptuous meals. I have not forgotten. It's a debt I know I have to repay when God makes me a trillionaire. And I know that's going to be very soon. Thank you, sir, for being your humble self, for being kind, for being a father to the fatherless, and above all, for making it possible for disadvantaged, vulnerable students to be able to stand on their feet and face the future. And I'm happy to have been part of this since 2008. Prof, sir, we are going to celebrate you at 100 in Jesus' name. And by that time, hey, no. are laughing, sir? why are you laughing? You are going to be 100, but you are, even, you are going to see my grandchildren. We are going to come to your house and visit you, my grandchildren. <laughs> Yeah, we're we'll laughing like because we're going to price. celebrate him in our room Happy last birthday. year. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy <laughs> birthday, sir. He bowed to what you Please, you, uh, I have to recommend that, you know, uh, okay, it's all right to uh, thank us like this, but everything you've done is due to your own determination, your own work. I've been, I'm very impressed by you. By the struggle you make, you know, to, to, to advance by yourself. I want to thank you for making it worthwhile for us. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, just to add to what Mabel has said, uh, it took Professor Femi Ojovison's birthday to give birth to Ibano Literary Society. And I think uh, Shola Adiemi explained it at the beginning. I mean, because in those days, it used to be a struggle to know where Oshovison belonged, Ife, Bini, or Ibadan. But we like to fight over him to say, no, he's an Ibadan man. Then the Bini people will say, no, Bini, then the Ife people. So when we we're conceiving the idea of uh, uh, the Ibadan Literary Society, it was actually very much at the center of it. And we thank you for allowing us to, to steal the limelight from your birthday to give birth to the idea of the literary society. You know that we do greater things in the future. They keep on inspiring us. So thank you very much. So Shala Adeyemi, co conspirator in the uh, literary society, is now your, your job for the birthday. No, it, it's just for us to sing a happy birthday and they uh, have already nominated Lukman to lead. So yeah. Lukman. <laughs> okay. Please. And look, yes, I'll be very French. happy to lead, and I will show my my ugly face now, um, right from Bubblesville in Lagos, Nigeria. <clears throat> everybody, can we go? Uh, in French. Everybody, uh, in French. In French. Uh, <laughs> I will see you. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, let's go now. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you.
everybody for today as i put in the in the chat we meet again tomorrow same place same time uh but tomorrow we're going to watch the unkrumani african written and directed by samuel shofison first premiered and presented at by Abibi groma group at the, in 1994 in Accra. And uh, we're also going to watch A Nightingale for Dr. Du Bois, written by female chefs and directed by Shegun Ojewi uh, at Carbondale in USA. We've chosen these two plays, especially because they've just been republished. Um, du Bois has just been published. It's never been published before. It's just been published. Nkrumani African has just been republished in conjunction with Keno. You know, is a, a new play which looks at the life of Maya Angelou, Maris Conde, and um, Efua Sutherland in Accra uh, in the 60s. So, but th there's a production of that done by Chuck Mike at Kennedy Center in 2020, but it's, it's not really been produced, but we're going to watch the two that have been produced. Uh, tomorrow, 4 p.m., followed by a forum, a discussion like this. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. I thank you very much, Professor Adele Kadeko, for accepting. When, when, when we invited you to give this talk, you did not even ask what talk it was, what it was all about. You just said, yes. And I said, oh, but it's going to be on this. You still say, yes. Oh, there are going to be many people there. Yes, even people who are going to execute you. Yes. Oh no, no, not that. <laughs> and then when it came to uh, Mabel Everoma, and I said, "Oh, Mabel, we need to do this." It said, "I'm going to speak. I'm going to give." I said, "But I just want to. No, I don't care. I want to speak. I want to talk. I want to give a lecture. I want to honor my father." And I said, "So we really appreciate what both of you have done. We and we're still going to be calling upon you because this is an annual thing, as you know, by the Liberal Society has come to stay." This year, we are not able to do our book conference, but next year, we're going to collaborate with the Ibadan Book Club and the Film Club and do the book conference. The last one we wanted to organize was uh, scuttled by COVID-19. Next year, we're going to do a bigger one and a bigger 78th birthday for Oshafisom. Thank you very much, everybody. See you tomorrow. Thank you. I won't miss it for Bye -bye. anything. I promise thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Good to see everyone. Please don't Thank forget you. to take your. Bye. Please don't forget to take your jollof rice. It's by the door. Evo.